Hi, I'm Gareth Green and in this video I'm going to offer you 10 preparation tips for music exams. And I've spent a lot of my life as a music examiner. So um, I've kind of experienced this all round. I was being a candidate myself in the past, of course, for exams. I've done a lot of examining and I've done a lot of teaching of people preparing for exams. So um, I'm hoping that these 10 tips will be of use to you if you are preparing to take an exam. Okay, so let's get going. What is the first tip? Number one, and this is about technical stuff, really. And it's this. Be well prepared. There's no substitute for being really well prepared technically. So you get to the point where you think, you know, I've done this so much that my pieces can't go wrong, my scales can't go wrong, and that I've got extra capacity to deal with what is very likely to be a nervous situation. And it's interesting because I've heard many people in the exam room kind of wobble a bit or go to pieces completely. And I have a kind of underlying gut feeling that probably normally this is absolutely fine. But under that extra pressure of the exam room situation, actually it's not quite as safe as they thought it was. And technically the whole thing kind of crumbles. And that's always a very disarming thing to happen. You know, if you can kind of get by, but you're not really absolutely on top of it, well, you haven't got much room for that sort of margin of error that can happen. Actually, if you're really well prepared, even if something goes wrong, you tend to handle it so much better. You know, you might play a wrong note, you might scuff something, but it doesn't disturb the flow or whatever. But if you're not really completely prepared and something goes wrong, you tend to stop and then panic and then things go downhill fast. So being really well prepared. And it's always surprised me in the exam room, sometimes when I say to somebody, um, okay, play me the scale of B major. And they say something like, oh no, not B major. Oh, I really dreaded that you might ask me that one. Well, try to be the right side of that, you know, so that you're not thinking, I hope that I don't get asked this scale or get asked this thing because I'm not very confident with that or I'm not quite sure or I didn't have time to learn it or, you know, whatever it is that's got in the way of that. So sort of going in feeling that technically you're not just able to do it, but you're so on top of it that it really just can't go wrong, really. You're feeling invincible, not because you're arrogant, but because you're so well prepared. So um, I can't emphasize that enough to be so well prepared that you've got extra capacity. Okay, so that's kind of like, you know, can we play the notes, the rhythms, have we got fingering sorted out, whatever it is we need to do on our instrument. Um, here's number two. It's kind of be attentive to this expressive detail. I always find it interesting um, how many performances I've heard over the years that don't fall into the trap that number one was suggesting, but where people come along and they play perfectly accurately, but it's kind of like the musical equivalent of watching paint dry, you know? It's just dull, boring, and you're thinking, that's a pity, this is a wonderful piece of music, but why am I thinking it sounds dull and boring? Well, often I have to sit back and think, well, I'm not really hearing any changes in dynamics, I'm not really hearing any of the phrasing, some of the detail, tempo changes, that kind of thing, not really coming across, maybe it's being played a bit too slowly, a bit under tempo, you know, so actually it hasn't really got what the composer is asking for beyond the notes. So up to a certain level, that will probably still um, get you some kind of pass outcome. But if you're really wanting to do well and to get a better result, then the expressive detail becomes really important. All the expressive detail that a composer's asked for, and then if you can go even further and think, well, what am I gonna add to that that really makes this performance something of my own as well? Well, that's absolutely fantastic. And that's when it gets very exciting. And I can think of performances I've heard in the exam room over the years where I've started thinking, well, this is a piece I've heard thousands of times. 
Um, and then somebody manages to knock me off my seat by playing it so expressively that they brought something new to it. And I've gone away kind of on a real high thinking, wow, that was just an amazing performance of that piece. And it's helped me to see something new, to hear something new in that music that didn't occur to me before. Well, that's wonderful if people can, can do that with it. So it, being really ex attentive to expressive detail. Um, <clears throat> okay, what's tip number three? Play with style. I mean, if your piece was written in the Baroque period and you play it as if it were a romantic piece, well, there's something going to be missing there, isn't there? So we need to think what's appropriate to this style um, and find a way of playing it that kind of respects that. But it's not just the style in terms of the period of composition, it's the character of the piece. What is the mood of this piece? Is it meant to be very quiet and reflective? Is it loud, fast, furious, slightly angry music? You know, what's going on? How, what can I do to convey the style of the piece? You know, to engage the emotions. All right, so that we're going beyond just producing notes or just producing notes with the right phrasing, with the right dynamics, but it still sounds a bit kind of detached, a bit robotic. But can we engage our emotion in it? Because sometimes when people do that, it's absolutely electric. Um, can we apply imagination? You know, that's what I was just talking about a moment ago, wasn't it? That um, if you can go beyond what's being asked for and say, oh, now, then I'm going to uh, add something of my own to this that really comes out of a musical imagination. That's fantastic. And I have to say, um, when I was in the exam room, uh, I was just longing to hear imaginative, stylistic, emotional performances. And if someone could produce something that was really uh, ticking those boxes, forgive them a wrong note here and there, because actually that's less important. I'd rather hear something that's really engaging, that's got a few slips in it, than something that's absolutely note perfect, absolutely accurate, on the pulse, rhythmic, everything, but hasn't got anything to say. So really thinking about those things, style, character, mood, emotional engagement, imagination. So you can kind of produce something that's not clinical, unimaginative, but is really, really engaging. Okay, here's tip number four. Don't make the exam the first performance. Now then, what do I mean by this one? Well, I may be wrong about this, but I don't think so. I think there are many people who go into the exam room and that is the first time they actually perform their pieces. They've spent the last months, however long they've been preparing this, um, kind of practicing, you know, trying things out, trying to get through the piece and all the rest of it. But they've never actually played these things to anybody else. Um, so that's something that a lot of people are shy about doing, and I understand that. But if the first time you play to somebody else, other than your teacher, is in the exam room, well, that's a pretty scary thing, actually, isn't it? Just to think, oh, okay, there's somebody sitting here who is a professional musician, now I've got to play it to them, having never played it to anybody. So think about what you can do. Play to other people. You can start with your own family, you know, whoever might be around you. Um, just get them in the room listening to you play your pieces for the exam, even listening to you play your scales. Why not, for goodness sake? That's what family are for, to be supportive of you. Um, so you might invite a few friends, a few neighbours around. You know, you can make, a, make an evening of it. You know, that's great. Turn it into some kind of social event and perform your program to them. So you get used to performing to other people. And let's face it, your friends and your family are the people who are most likely to be on your side. And even if things go wrong, well, it doesn't matter. I was teaching somebody not so long ago who was suffering a lot with nerves and uh, he decided to perform his program to a small group of invited friends and family and he said he started the first piece and it all went wrong, just completely crashed and he had to start again and he felt dreadful about it. But actually, uh, they were all very forgiving, very encouraging and then it all went much better the second time 
Um, but by the time he got to the exam, it was absolutely fine. No examiner would have known that he'd had that experience. But wouldn't have that been awful for him if that had happened actually in the exam? So don't make the exam the first performance. Preferably have lots of outings. You know, just think, where else can I do this? You know, um, if you're in school, maybe you can give a performance in school or college or wherever you are. Um, if you've got friends who just want to come and listen to you play, most people are delighted to receive an invitation to come to a free concert, for goodness sake. Even if it's a very short one, maybe you've just got 10 minutes of music and they can come round and have a drink and listen to 10 minutes of music, you'll make their day. Uh, so that's great. You know, use those opportunities to get used to performing. Because I think one thing we have to do is make a distinction between practicing and practicing performing. They're slightly different things actually. Um, so practicing the pieces, getting to know them, tweaking things, just rehearsing bars that just need to be a bit more solid, all that stuff, all terribly important. But then practice performing, starting at the beginning, playing the whole piece, turning the page, playing the second piece, moving on like that, actually practice performing. Lots of people I think don't actually do that, but it's a really helpful thing to do. Okay, number five, what's this going to be? Frame your performance. Now, what do I mean by that? Frame your performance. Well, this often happens. People sit down, turn the page, open my first and they just start playing. And it hasn't got any sense of kind of setting the atmosphere before we begin. I wonder if you've ever been to a concert where some great performer has come on the stage and everybody stops clapping and then there's just what feels like a quite a period of silence and you suddenly think, have they forgotten how it goes or they're not quite sure what the first note is or something, you know, that, that's not true. Uh, but what they're doing is they're allowing the atmosphere just to get into the right zone and then the first note comes out of that silence. Wow, that can be really effective, setting that atmosphere. When they finish the performance, do they play the last note and then walk off? No, they don't. They play the last note if it's a quiet finish or often quite still for a while before they just relax and, and then maybe stand up and take a bow, or whatever they're going to do. So framing the performance, creating an atmosphere before it starts, maintaining an atmosphere at the end of it, that really enhances the impact of what's done rather than just get playing and then think, oh dear, I'm going at the wrong speed and all this kind of stuff. You know, think it through before you start, create the atmosphere. Don't rush on to the next piece after you finish the first one. Frame the performance, that's a really good thing to do. Um, here's uh, number six. Um, ensure that your supporting work is strong. Now, what do I mean here? by supporting work? Well, it depends on what kind of exam you're taking. Um, but often in exams, you've got to play pieces, but you've also got to play scales, do some sight reading, do some oral tests, maybe some other things as well. Um, it's amazing how many people play their pieces really well. And you think, oh, fantastic. It was lovely to hear that. And then you get onto the scales and you suddenly think, oh my goodness, is this the same person? They don't know the scales, they're stopping and starting, having another go, repairing notes, abandoning scales, not even attempting to get a scale started, you know. Well, that's a pity, isn't it? You've just got really good marks on the pieces, suddenly the scales go to the wall. Um, or they look at the sight reading like, goodness, what am I going to do with this? Because they haven't actually practiced sight reading. You know, that's a useful skill, isn't it, in music? So picking up music regularly and just reading even a line of it. So that's part of the regular development of our musical lives. You know, oral tests, have we done enough of that? You know, especially these days when we've got so many resources like apps, Music Matters courses, all this kind of stuff, where we can actually kind of do a load of practice on this on our own. We don't have to wait until we see a teacher. We can work on that on our own and then our teacher can help us develop some skills. So making sure that we're really well prepared across the board and we don't put all our energy into pieces and then forget the other stuff. Um, so 
that is going to give you confidence as well across the whole thing. I think if you go in dreading that somebody's going to ask you to sight read or do an oral test, it has a kind of negative impact on the whole thing because all the time you're playing pieces, you're thinking, oh no, I know what's coming next and I won't be able to do that. If you're thinking, oh great, well I can play the pieces, I'm looking forward to the scales, sight reading, yeah, they're great. That gives you so much more confidence. Okay, tip number seven may seem a funny one but I'm going to put it up here. Enjoy the exam. <laughs> well, I can hear some people thinking, well, that's a great idea, but, you know, I absolutely hate exams. I dread them. You know, oh, there was a nervous wreck last time I went. I can't believe I'm going to go and do another one. All this stuff. Loads of people experience that. But actually try to enjoy the exam. I mean, you're not going to the dentist for a tooth extraction. You know, that's not what a music exam is, you know. Don't worry about what the examiner's doing, what the examiner's writing. It's a funny thing, this as well, but I've often had the impression as an examiner that as soon as you start writing, people think, what have I done wrong? Because they assume you've started to make a list of all their sins and their errors. Actually, quite often, the first thing that, that an examiner is going to write is something complimentary. Uh, so it may be that you started playing the piece and the examiner's thinking, gosh, well, that's going at a really good tempo, some lovely tone there. I love the balance between the hands or I love the sound that's coming out of that clarinet or that flute, whatever it is. And the examiner started to write about all those positives. So, so don't immediately think, oh my goodness, I must have done something wrong because the examiner's writing away for dear life, you know. Um, so don't worry about what the examiner's doing. The examiner's got a job to do and it's not the same as your job. Your job is to go in, do your best, kind of deliver everything as well as you can and just leave the examiner to get on with his or her job and focus on giving your best performance. And if you can enjoy doing that, you know, because of all these other things, you're so well prepared that you can think, actually, I'm really looking forward to playing this to somebody now. I feel confident I can do it. I know I can play these things. I've thought about all these things. And now I'm really going to enjoy sharing this with somebody who, if you enjoy sharing it with them, they're going to enjoy listening to it. That's going to be great. So that's wonderful. Okay, now just in case things don't quite go to plan, here's tip number eight. Mistakes are history. Oh, okay, why am I putting that on the board now? Mistakes are history. Often what happens is if something unfortunately goes wrong during a performance, somebody will start tutting or pulling a face or saying something under their breath or something. Well, that doesn't really belong to a performance. The art of bluff is really important, you know? I've played in performances, I'll freely admit it, where I've made some kind of mistake along the way and I think, where on earth did that come from? And I kind of get cross with myself about it and all the rest of it. But you just keep a straight face, you just keep playing, you pretend that absolutely nothing's gone wrong whatsoever. Don't give away the fact that you made a mistake. That kind of destroys the performance. And if anybody says to me afterwards, you played G sharp in bar 96, then I can always say, oh, I was playing the other version of this piece. Anyway, um, but once you've made a mistake, it's history. Don't spend the rest of the piece or the rest of the exam thinking, oh my goodness, I can't believe what I did in bar six. I've never made that mistake before, or I always make that mistake in bar six. It's happened, it's history. Get on with the next thing. And mistakes often feel like very big events in exams. But actually, you know, you might come out and you think, oh, blast, I played three wrong notes. Well, how many right notes did you play? Probably hundreds, thousands of right notes. And if three of them are wrong, well, it's a tiny proportion, isn't it? Um, so try to get mistakes in perspective. Once they've gone, you can't do anything about them. Move on, forget about them, concentrate on the next thing that you're going to do and make that as good as you can. OK, here's a very practical one. On the day when you arrive for an exam, don't arrive too early and don't arrive too late. And I've seen both of those things happen and it often has a negative impact on what goes on. Um, people who think I must be there in plenty of time, they turn up an hour before and then they're kind of pacing around in the waiting room or 
walking around the building or something and all the anxiety is just increasing the longer they're waiting that's not going to be healthy by the time you get in there you'll be a nervous wreck I've also come across those people who arrive late sometimes I feel very sorry for them something's gone wrong the bus has broken down whatever it is um, and then they're naturally stressed and you'll find that examiners are a lovely bunch of people really and they'll do everything they can to to help you deal with that kind of situation but I've also been in situations where you know there's been some last minute panic where it's been impossible to park the car people have ended up running to the exam they come into the exam room completely flustered does that help you deliver your best not really so you know kind of 15 20 minutes before is quite nice it gives you a chance just to sit relax just kind of settle yourself put the journey behind you put the rest of the day behind you maybe warm up a little bit so you're all set but not over warming up and then you'll go into the exam room and everything will be well and if things are running a little bit ahead or a little bit behind it won't really affect things too much so not too early not too late and here's number 10 and this is kind of like after the exam you know relax <laughs> And I think that's quite an important thing as well, because sometimes after the exam, people get very kind of pent up between that point and the results arriving, sort of worrying about, oh, I did this and I did that and I forgot to do that and I got this wrong. And actually, you can't do anything about it. It's back to mistakes of history. So once the exam's finished, relax. And actually, why not treat yourself to something? It's quite nice, isn't it? Come out of the exam room and think, you know what? I'm going to go to a cake shop or something. Whatever it is, you know, do something nice that sort of gets you over the stress of it. <coughs> and remember this, I think it's a really important thing. The fact that you've even turned up to the exam, whatever the result is, the fact you've turned up and you've put yourself through that means that you have achieved something that most people in the world will never achieve. Most people will never put themselves in that particular sort of firing line it's kind of it's a very vulnerable place in which to be isn't it to think here I am I've turned up and I'm going to perform to this professional musician and give her my best most people think forget me I'm not doing that uh, and they'd rather sit at home doing something watching the telly or something I don't know um, so you've put yourself on the line you've pushed yourself to do this and that is fantastic and that in itself is a wonderful achievement. If you get the result you deserve as well, well, that's all great as well. But the fact that you've even done it, you know, celebrate that as a success in its own right. Well, there we are. There are other tips we could uh, offer, but those are 10 possible tips from me that might be useful if you're preparing for an exam. And if you're taking an exam sometime soon, good luck, enjoy, do your best, and I absolutely hope that you get the result that you deserve.